So for Black History Month and Valentine's Day, just sort of knock two videos out of the way, yeah, but I will be seeing Black Panther, so I'll more than likely talk about that if I actually do go see it. So I wanted to talk about two subjects that I thought would really help tie it all together. And for that, I thought, well, what's my favorite black sitcom? And it has to be Family Matters. And one of the reasons I say this is because I never feel that Family Matters is trying to oversell something or there's anything more than just this is a family and here they are. I think that's a big point for a lot of shows, especially if you're going for a diversity thing. We you know we're pushing um, more people of color, more different representations. At some point, they have to stop being this is a black family and here's our life. And it isn't to say you can't deal with those issues, but I always feel those things should take a back seat to the overall premise of the show. And by that, I mean where most people will say Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is their favorite black sitcom, for the most part, especially in the 90s. I often feel that it still falls into the line of one of two categories for black sitcoms. You're either the family in the ghetto or you're the rich family. That's kind of it. And you see that with Sanford and Son, um, Good Times, The Jeffersons, The Cosby Show. The Cosby Show is actually, I would say, upper middle class for the most part. But it, it's primarily due to the amount of kids I think they had. Like, if they had fewer kids, I think the Hutchinsons would be higher up going by their professions. But uh, with Family Matters, I never got anything more than the fact that we're a family. We're a middle class family. And that's kind of it. That's, that's what we are. Oh, yeah, we happen to be black. And that doesn't say, that, again, that they couldn't tackle those any issues, because they do. They're not good at it. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I think, overall, tackles issues better. Um, but Fresh Prince of Bel-Air isn't good at dealing with the whole episode, or at least the B-plot of an episode, for the most part. And what I mean is, take the police episode. So both Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Family Matters both have an episode with the police, and it's, it's about you know how minorities are treated by the police. So, with Carlton and Will's adventure with the police, it is played up mostly for comedy until the end. And that is inherently bad. But compare this to, the, to Family Matters, where it is entire B-plot. Okay, so Eddie gets in trouble with the police. He's harassed by the police. Carl goes to talk to the police officers because he's a cop and he's trying to figure out exactly what happened. And then he and Eddie have a talk about what to do with Eddie's um, rage and feelings of hurt and lack of dignity after the event and that motivates him to file the complaint at the station and later on in the series Eddie becomes a police officer I felt that was really great really interesting because it's not just that one singular event you saw the scene on Facebook probably probably seen on seen on Facebook when Carl is talking to the two officers the problem I have with that clip is that it doesn't really have the entire thing you can compress Everything in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, every great moment to the end of an episode. The most notably, when Will is having that great moment when he's trying to put up the front that, you know, he doesn't care that his dad left him again. No, it's far from that. Is he putting up that great front and then he breaks down? It's a brilliant scene, but you didn't need to see the rest of it for that. You didn't. With Family Matters, every single scene of that issue with Eddie and the police, well, the story of Eddie and the police, is part of a much bigger story. But again, I think it's it's a two-way street, honestly. I think people can make an argument that one of that Freshman's Bel Air living single Martin and whatnot could all be better than Family Matters. I'm not here to say that this is indiscriminately, undeniably, objectively the best one. No. I think what I like best about Family Matters is one of the things I like best about Freshman's Bel Air, and that's the characters, especially Steve and Carlton, because black nerds are, they aren't actually that different from regular nerds, really, but there is a certain social stigma to them, and what I mean is, the, you've probably all heard this at some point, you don't sound black, you don't act black, and that's more reflective of Carlton than of Steve, but the Family Matters universe doesn't seem to really hold race as an issue, and I think Again, Fresh Prince Bel-Air handles Carlton a bit better in that aspect, but he only handles that aspect better in regards to Will, because for the most part, at school, no one has a problem with Carlton. I mean, we saw that before, like, he's actually the coolest one there, and it could be because, oh, we have a black friend, but not really. He still has the same interests as the rest of them. Carlton's issue is there's a class-class culture divide, 
and Will's constantly calling him out on it. With Steve, he's just a nerd, and he's treated like just a nerd. Actually, he's the ultimate nerd, depending on how you go about it. But what I love about Will, what about Carlton and Steve in this is that they're totally unapologetic for being nerds. And that isn't a very important thing, I think, when you write nerds in television. They should never feel they have to apologize for being themselves. And that's not to say that if they do something wrong or if they've offended you or hurt you, they don't have to apologize. The idea is that you have a problem with them, with who they are. That is on you. That is totally on you, not my responsibility. And, you know, it, that I think is really important. Steve and Carlton at no point ever feel they have to really change who they are. As a matter of fact, they like themselves because of how different they are. But I think we're going in circles here. We're here to talk also about the relationship between Steve and Laura. And the relationship between Steve and Laura is always a bit weird because some days Steve's infatuation with her goes a bit beyond acceptable. Like maybe we should have called the police or maybe the Winslow should have ever bothered to lock their doors because Steve just walks in. Why? Because no one locks the door. But I often think that the real strength of Steve and Laura's relationship, and people have debated whether or not it should have happened or if it was a horrible mistake. I think it was a good thing because it furthered the interactions that Steve has with each of the characters. Steve was never intended to be a mainstay character, but he played off so well with three of the best characters in Family Matters, Eddie, Carl, and Laura. He really helped change the direction of the show, and you know, you could say it was for the worst or for the best. I think it was great with what we got. And I think everything good can be summed up in the relationship between Steve and Laura. So that's what we're going to talk about, and we're going to break it down into three eras. The middle school era, the high school era, and the college era. So not into seasons. I think that's always a bit of a mistake. Well, at least in this case. So let's start with middle school and work our way down. So Steve was introduced as a one-shot character, as a date for Laura by her father. Um, but he, had, he was not aware of... Steve's obsession with her, or exactly who Steve was. Laura did know Steve, as it turns out, he's been infatuated with her since kindergarten, and since then he's been determined to win her love. It was clear that it was clear that Laura honestly was not interested in Steve, and saw him like everyone else did, a nerd, and not just any nerd, mind you, but the ultimate example of a nerd. And this is shown best in how he dresses. You know, he's got the hiked up pants that are a bit too tight, the suspenders, the huge glasses, and the nasally, nasally high-pitched voice. When you first look at Steve as a character, you would think that his infatuation with Laura was really just as superficial as anything else could be at his age. And we don't know exactly what started this romance, but in the episode Marriage, we do see exactly how passionate he, he is about her. And Laura does at times find endearing when he says, I know I'm not worthy of you, but I can't help loving you. It's like wanting to touch a star. You know you'll never reach it, but you've got to just keep trying. The two of them found a growing friendship that worked so long as Steve kept the professions of love to a minimum. I think a great moment was when Steve had been dating another girl, and this was before Myra, and Laura didn't quite know what to do, and Rachel told her, like, look, at some point when you didn't know it, you and Steve became friends. And we see them interact, like when Laura and Steve tried out for cheerleading and basketball, respectively, the two of them didn't get a chance to play whether it was because the captain of the Chilean team didn't like Laura, or if Steve was just too small so people didn't give him a chance to play, it was Steve who motivated her to keep the faith that her time would come, and whenever someone bullied or took advantage of Steve, usually it was Eddie who took advantage of him, it is off, quite often Laura who calls them out and fixes it. So then we come to the high school years, and the high school, I think, is where we really come to this greater understanding of Steve and Laura's dynamic. So, by the time they entered high school, there was no actual sign of Steve's feeling for Laura dying down. As a matter of fact, he seemed to have upped his game, and we saw exactly how far Steve was willing to go for her when he altered his DNA to create Stefan or Kel. Now, Stefan was everything Laura wanted in a guy, and what Steve always wanted to be, suave, cool, someone who people wanted to hang out with. Though he proved to be horribly shallow and narcissistic to the point where Laura demanded Stefan turn himself back into Steve. The two of them continued to be friends, though Laura would never actually admit it, at least to his face for the most part. Steve's patience with Laura did come to a head when he offered to drive her to Cincinnati for a competition after she overslept and said that just because she didn't love him didn't mean that she could treat him like garbage. We also saw really great moments the two of them would share 
not just at this point, but even further back with things like Laura going for the Black History Month ex uh, presentations that was shot down, him helping her run for class president. And more interestingly, when t when her bo when her then short boyfriend Ted had spread rumors that she that she and Ted had gone all the way, and Steve was the first one to come to her defense, actually fighting Ted or attempting to fight Ted, and then when Laura said he was lying when Steve told her, and it put an actual dent in their friendship until we found until Laura found out the truth, and even then she was very upset with the fact with how she treated Steve. But the relationship, I think, really hit a huge milestone when Laura had finally had enough of Steve interrupting her date. And Steve would go through numerous ways. He would he would dress up as someone just to get her current date out of the way and attempt to make his move, which is where it gets a bit creepy. If, you know, spite changing your DNA wasn't creepy enough. But as an, uh, to finally find a way to distract Steve from her, and she hooked him up with with one of her boyfriend's cousins, Myra Boutros, Boutros Monkhouse, who was in a lot of ways the female version of Steve Urkel, and the two would eventually date, but at the same time, Laura would admit to missing Steve's companionship as a friend, and it created a sort of interesting rivalry between Laura and Myra, as Myra knows that Steve, that Laura has a special power or hold over Steve that he, that Laura wouldn't exploit, but Myra doesn't trust him. Myra's very super in love with Steve to the point where it actually gets kind of creepy, like even a bit creepier than Steve's. And throughout their time together, Laura would defend Steve despite how annoying she found him. Like when Steve was accused of blowing up the science lab, um, she took the initiative even though he'd probably be out of her hair. And at some point, Steve would later attempt to turn into Stefan again, using a more perfected version of the transformation juice this time with the Transformation Chamber, which would become one of the greatest things in the show's history. And But this this transformation, while having none of the narcissism or shallowness, the transformation would not last. And Steve had resolved to, you know what, we have to perfect this. He's going to perfect this so he can be with Laura. Stefan, and when this did happen, Stefan found himself happy with Laura, but at the same time he didn't like himself, so he couldn't, so he couldn't maintain this. And Laura sadly accepted this. It's an interesting thing to note, the sort of in the the relation between Steve and Stefan here. We don't quite know how it works because the way Stefan acts, he's very much aware that he has just been created, even though he is the same age as Steve. You could argue he's maybe a few weeks old, but he is also fully developed, among other things. And we'll see the impact Stefan and Steve will have on Laura later on in the series, as well as Myra. It, it gets really interesting exactly what was going to happen with what would have happened with Steve, with Steve, Laura, Stefan, and Myra had the show got its actual 10th season. But here we are on college and the actual final season. By the time they'd gone to college, the two of them had become even greater friends, though Steve was still just as clumsy and sometimes as irritating as always, especially since Steve had moved in with the Winslows by this point. Steve had begun to go steady with Myra, and as far as we knew, it seemed that, he's, that while he may have still loved Laura, he had no intention of pursuing her romantically. When Steve had accidentally when Steve had cloned himself, Laura came up with the idea of transforming the clone into Stefan, and those two pursued, an, pursued a serious relationship. Stefan would later propose to Laura when they had gone to Disney World, but he realized that he himself still had no idea who he was as a person, so the two decided to wait while he became a model in Paris. At some point, Steve found himself looking for a change. It was actually his 21st birthday. And he came to the idea that he couldn't just be himself. He had to be better. So he started to improve himself. Getting different clothes, no longer wearing the ultimate nerd ensemble of uh, a really loud polo shirts, bright suspenders, tight pants, a letterman sweater. I think that's a letterman sweater. And it, it, that has an impact on Laura. She starts to notice the changes he's made. And she starts finding him more attractive and more interesting. It's, it should be noted that these are not changes to his personality, but changes to the outer shell. He's enhancing his inner beauty with his outer beauty to an extent. That's right. I saw... I saw Son-in-Law. Loved the movie. Possibly Polly Shore's best film outside of a goofy movie. One night at a party, Laura gets pretty drunk trying to prove she's not a goody two-shoes. And... 
when Steve brings her home, she sort of flirts with him a bit more, and they kiss. The next morning, Laura, well, hungover, is greeted by Steve that morning, says he'd like to discuss the kiss and see exactly where they're going. Laura denies that this, that she, that this ever happened or that she remembers it, but she later confides in Max that she did remember and she liked the kiss. So Steve starts trying to prove himself and draws Laura's eye. He doesn't quite know what's going on until an experiment allows him to actually read Laura's mind as well as others, and he hears Laura think about, you know, she has feelings for Steve, and this changes Steve's approach to everything. So Steve breaks it off with Myra so he can pursue a romantic relationship with Laura or some form of further his, his relationship with Laura, and the two will eventually get married, but not before Stefan also proposes, and it comes down to an interesting choice between, for Laura but between her ideal guy and the guy she grew up with, and she ultimately picks Steve, and it's really sweet. So that ultimately sums up, I think, Steve and Laura, at least from a history standpoint. There are some fun little bits, there, like namely when Steve celebrates the thousandth time he's um, asked Laura out, and she says no. He's like, you know, I'm going to keep trying. But for the most part, I think we got everything. And now let's talk about the characters, and we'll talk about them in, in level of magnitude. So we'll start off with Laura. So, as a character, Laura honestly is a bit hard to place, as her role in the story almost feels at first to be the love interest for Steve, but in the before Steve was introduced, she was a very... she's actually the same character. But I think St seeing Steve gave her character a bit more to play off, of because there's a lot of wit to Laura's character, and I think she really brought it out more with Steve. So, Laura comes off as a rather fully realized character, I think. She's a type A personality in a lot of ways, with a lot of wit to her, again, which I think the show prided itself on. Laura holds not only a high standard for herself, but others, and she seeks to do the right thing, and from a young age, she envisions big things for herself. She wants to attend Harvard and become a lawyer, but when she finds out her father cannot afford to send her there, she tells them that she doesn't want to go to Harvard and send attends state school. Laura hates bullies and people who try to tell her what to do. She broke it off with one of her boyfriends because he told her to stop hanging out with Steve. A lot of the trouble Laura usually got into involved her trying to prove to people that, you know, she could be a quote-unquote bad girl instead of quote-unquote Miss Perfect Goody Two-Shoes. When it came to Steve, I like to compare her relationship with him for the early days with that of Naruto and Sakura in the first part of Naruto. And again, I really felt that Naruto and Sakura made more sense than Shippuden, but whatever, whatever. What I'm saying is, Laura doesn't hate Steve, and she doesn't really dislike him, but she finds him annoying at times, and for the most part, she considers him a friend, and this goes more and more as the series continues. I think in a lot of ways, Laura's feelings for Steve not only began, not only uh, flourished in episodes where she saw how far he would go for her, like searching the dumpsters for hours in the winter to find her lost doll, Emily, but also just in how much she missed him when he was gone. When she did date Stefan the first time, while she hated that he was shallow and vain, what really drew the line was when he called Steve a village idiot. When she, when she and Stefan are dating again, she does start to notice Steve more as he tries to improve himself the final time they start dating. Wearing better fitting clothes and improving his speech, again, these don't change who he is, but it does let him be seen differently. Laura has stated that there are things about Steve she has always found attractive. His kindness, his generous, his intelligence, and his ability to make her laugh. When she does start dating Steve, she at first thinks she wouldn't enjoy things like polka houses and themed restaurants. Like, they go for um, Spanish food, and he dan and Steve dresses in the style of flamenco dancers, and it's hilarious and fun. And Laura herself admits she has fun, even though she probably wouldn't like to always be seen in public. And one thing she mentions, especially in the Polka House episode, is that she gets to see a side of Steve she never saw before, like this whole other life Steve has, to which Steve Steve jokingly says, well, it was probably during that nice little tenure period when you weren't talking to me. And when ultimately given the choice of marrying Steve or Stefan, Laura realizes she cannot imagine life without Steve and accepts his proposal. Steve I always found to be a truly interesting character, especially when you think about who he is under the suspenders, accordion, love of cheese, and science. It's mentioned early on that Steve's parents don't actually, I think love is a strong word, like him. They don't let him meet his extended family. They go out of their way to avoid um, being together, to, to avoid conceiving another child that might be like him. 
and his mother has him referred to her by her actual name, Roberta, over mom or mother. This explains why he goes to the Winslow house so much. He wants to be a part of something, a part of a family. His interest in Laura doesn't seem to be just a physical attraction, as he remembers in kindergarten when she shoved Play-Doh in his face, and it's implied that that's when it started. Steve even still remembers her favorite song back then, If You're Happy, You Know It, Clap Your Hands, and he has the violinist perform it when they go out, out eating, and to me it was such a great moment to show exactly the kind of person Steve is. When it comes to his character, Steve does seem to have a knack for seeing the best in people and not giving up hope and wanting to help people. There's a certain innocence to him, and I often wonder if this all comes because he himself has had no one to help him. He's had no one there. We find out that Steve doesn't know how to swim, doesn't know how to ride a bike. He's never had people take an interest in him. He actually does view the Winslows as a family he always wanted, and admits to having nothing but great respect for Carl, viewing him as a father he always wanted. And this goes as well to Eddie, who he views as not only his best friend, but his surrogate brother. In the creation of Stefan, I think we also see something interesting, as Stefan is created first in the image he sees that Steve sees popular kids as. Smooth, confident, cool, yet totally shallow and hating Steve Urkel, yet still in love with Laura. When Steve became Stefan totally, he found himself unhappy because he wasn't himself, implying that Steve doesn't like the idea of being only what people would like him to be. In regards to Laura, Steve has shown that he is willing to go through any lengths to protect her, fighting bullies and risking his life in races, just on the off chance that she might get hurt. However, we have seen that Steve won't do anything to force Laura to do something as he as he let her off the hook for, for agreements for dates and kisses, although he does make them. He often um, backs out when it's time for her to pay up. He's like, no, I can't do this because I don't want you to do it because you feel you owe it to me. If that's dishonest, I long for the day when you actually want to kiss me. When she was under the influence of a powerful aphrodisiac he had created and she was throwing herself at him, Steve admitted he couldn't take advantage of her like that and he quickly took the antidote. He's also refused to become Stefan for their senior prom because Stefan didn't go to high school for four years. He did. Uh, Stefan was the president, founder, and only member of the Cheese Club. He was. I think what I like best about Steve is, is in his regards to how he handles his relationship with Myra, which had become strained as he began trying to improve himself. Upon finding out that Laura had feelings for him, Steve broke it out with Myra and was very upfront about it. While it felt immature, Steve knew he couldn't be happy with Myra if he didn't try, and he really was doing her a disservice if he's hanging out with Myra and still wondering about Laura. It should be noted that Steve had, had never had never really seen himself as worthy of Laura, even going so far as to leave for Russia because he didn't think he, he she would pick him over Stefan and that Stefan was the better choice. He'd be able to give her things he never could. He views Stefan as better, someone he had created to be in his mind, a better version of him and the only person worthy of Laura. So, coming up to the final thoughts, I think what ultimately made Steve and Laura work as a couple was that they were not only similar people, but they were always the same people consist consistently throughout the series. Steve and Laura are both people of principles who set standards for themselves that they come close to breaking, but ultimately don't. It is not only Steve's balanced devotion to Laura that works, but also Laura's sincerity. Laura doesn't mince words with how she feels about Steve, but at the same time, she is still his friend, and for all of Steve's faults, she knows she can count on him to be honest with her. In a lot of ways, the relationship is a lot like that of Ron and Kim from Kim Possible. It's interesting that when you think about their other love interests, Myra and Stefan, that they in a lot of ways reflect a failure to grow and change. With Myra, Steve is allowed not to change, only liking himself and not improving, as Myra seems to only want Steve a certain way, and honestly, she kind of fetishizes him in a way that he never did with Laura. The day, the episode when Steve uh, is planning to break up with Myra, Myra intentionally... Uh, cuts him off and breaks up with him because she doesn't like that he's changing his clothes and his habits. He's still the same person, but she isn't willing to accept him as something different than what she likes. With Stefan, Laura had her ideal guy, her dream come true. This is shown even more in how he proposed to her at Disney World, in front of the castle of dreams, then both dressed as Cinderella and Prince Henri, or Prince Charming, depending on what school of Disney Cinderella you subscribe to, his name's Henri. When Stefan brings it up, she is touched, but she is more touched by the memory of when a younger Steve presented her with a ring in the episode Marriage. Both Steve and Laura grow up realizing that they cannot ideally stay the same, and that there are going to be things that change that change how your life goes that don't really stop you. 
the more I think about it, Laura's story in the show is about how is about her learning of the reality of the world, that grand things aren't needed and that it doesn't always work out exactly the way you want it to. Her friend Maxine doesn't want to be a lawyer, she can't afford to go to Harvard, and this really grand gesture from Stefan, it pales a comparison to the simplicity of Steve's profession to her, which was made purely out of love. Steve's story is honestly about learning to grow, as he in a lot of ways has grown complacent. He's gotten so used to the idea of liking himself that he's never thought that a change may be a good thing. Stefan goes through more changes than anyone else in the series, I think, and Steve is present through all of it, primarily because it's actually Steve changing most of the time. And it could be argued that Stefan either took his development, or that neither of them would ever truly develop into full people, which according to some sources say that would have happened when Stefan died in season 10, sending parts of himself back into Steve, which allows Steve to have his Julia White voice, which I felt was really great. Now, Steve learns to change not so people will like him, but so he will like himself. This, I think, is why the relationship between Steve and Laura work, because the relationship is one of friendship, growth, and love, in that order. Or maybe I'm wrong, it's totally nothing, I liked it, and maybe at the end of the day, Steve really was horribly creepy, horribly stalkerish, and even though he never broke into Laura's room, he didn't stop him, <laughs> he never decided not to go in there when Laura pulled him in there. And maybe I'm wrong, so um, leave your response down in the comment section about your favorite um, black sitcom, black cartoon, whatever, or favorite couple. This is for Valentine's Day and Black History, and I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Think Tank signing out. May your fandom serve you well.